are listening to Estate at the Union, estate planning made simple. Here's your host, Brad Wewell, from Texas Trust Law in Austin, Texas. Hi, this is Brad Wewell with Texas Trust Law. This is the most recent edition of the Estate of the Union, the podcast we put on to educate you about things in the estate planning world that you need to know. And today we have a fantastic guest with Ann Lovely. Hello. Hello, who is our Director of Post-Life Services, which means Ann and her team help folks that have lost loved ones. And this really is the rubber meets the road when it comes to estate planning. What happens to my stuff after I'm gone? And people fight over this stuff if you're not careful. So Ann, um, you have been here many, many years, and why don't you uh, maybe share with our audience some things you've seen and some cautionary tales. Well, today I think we wanted to talk about like the stuff, your stuff. And so your will and your trust um, normally govern your stuff, and that's something that I don't think people realize. So quite often, right after someone passes away, before they even meet with an attorney, the family will go through the house and, and take things because <laughs> they want mom's china or they want right. dad's um, guns, something like that. Sure. Um, and they, they might not realize that those items are actually governed by their will or the trust, mm -hmm. and it's really the independent executor or the trustee that needs to be um, taking control of these items and helping determine where they go. Yeah, it can be, I've seen in my experience, I've been doing this many, many years, decades, um, kind of a free-for-all almost. Or sometimes it's the first one in the house. Often I think it is, and I, oddly enough, I've seen people take television sets. <laughs> and um, in today's world, they're not that expensive, but not too infrequently, that's been been the beef between the kids is that huh. um, one one sibling took the TV and I want to be reimbursed for the TV and things like and that. And this is a TV you could buy at Walmart or Probably Best Buy so. for two or three hundred bucks that right. used to be you know, when they came out fifteen hundred dollars, but little things like that. I mean, you would think, and I have seen before. Um, there was a family heirloom painting, and so there was discord about who was gonna get that painting, and we had to come up with a solution of how to deal with that, um, because it's not something that's always taken care of in your planning. And people don't think about it. I think sometimes picture people, their loved ones coming in, hey, it's Christmas, let's go through all of mom's stuff, all of dad's stuff, and just start, you know, jumbling. And, and, and one of the things, um, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm gonna bring your attention that is so subtle, but so important in a good estate plan is minimizing potential points of friction between family members, okay? That's what people want, that's what you pay for. It's not so much necessarily who gets the retirement account or who gets the house, Sure, you can fight over that, but people go to the death over mom's wedding ring and things like that. So let's go off a little further, in on um, some things you've seen, too. Well, with that picture situation, um, we ended up coming up with a solution where we had to have that uh, that picture reproduced. And then they flipped a coin to see who would get the reproduction and who got the um, original print. Wow. So like, and, and, and that sounds, it's humorous, but it was serious as it could be for them. We have to remember like people are grieving. And so you right. have heightened emotions um, on, you know, on top of the stuff. It might not really be about the stuff. Um, it might be about underlying issues, you know, things, that they've grown up with that are just coming to surface because of the situation. <clears throat> so it's best if you have a good plan and order and you can prevent that, you know, for your kids mm -hmm. to go through um, by, by letting people know ahead of time how you want things to go. Mm -hmm. And if people can't agree or you haven't written things out, provide a solution, um, give instructions to the people that are going to be administering your estate so that there are rules to follow. Um, and, and it makes it easier um, with siblings if there's 
black and white rules. And this is what mom and dad said. This is how right. we're going to handle things. Um, it just makes it a lot easier. But it is, like you said, not something people really think about. They think about their bank accounts, their right. house, these larger items. And often it does come down to the stuff where you see the friction. And I don't want to sound sexist, God help me. But in my experience doing this for decades, men don't seem to care that much about stuff, except firearms. Women tend to care a lot more about the stuff. Uh, in my own personal case, my mom had my sister and myself into her home, and she was, gosh, by this time, late 80s, <clears throat> and said, uh, Brad, I'm going to give you first pick. Go through the house and pick anything you want to out of my house because I'm going to move to assisted living that I want you to have whatever you want. And my sister's there, and she said, yeah, go ahead. So I picked out a globe, an old globe, one or two other things, and I said, you know, Mom, that's it? She said, are you sure? I said, yeah. My sister said, great. I'll take the rest. I'll take the rest. And she was serious. I mean, she said it in jest, but she was serious. And, and frankly, she could have the rest. I don't care about I don't the rest. think you're incorrect. I, I mean, it is probably a little sexist. I'm sure there are men out there that have sentimental attachments sure. to stuff, but I think the majority of what I've seen, um, I've been administering estates for about 12 years now, mm -hmm. and it is mom's jewelry. And th that was right. a big one. And so, um, in fact, I have an ongoing case right now where that's one of the last things to happen. And there's mm -hmm. three sisters, and there's contention, and um, they really came up with a brilliant idea. Um, okay. And they're going to have an independent person present. And then another thing is only have the family that's getting the stuff present. Not in-laws. Not husbands and wives, not kids, just the direct people involved okay. because you don't need people chirping in ears. You know, you don't need to escalate right. the issue any further. And the more people you bring to the situation, the more difficult it could be. But their idea was to have... Um, well, there was, they cataloged everything. So there's a catalog of all of the, the jewelry and values. And um, I think they were basically going to go through a lottery system and mm -hmm. take turns, but that, that individual neutral party was going to catalog it in writing mm -hmm. and calculate the total so that at the end of the day, they'd make sure everyone got their equal share. Okay. And that's one, so that's one idea. <clears throat> yeah, you can value things. Um, some things have a lot of value and you have to be careful uh, let's talk about valuable, valuable, valuable stuff. Um, there, if you're the executor or the trustee and you've got valuable, valuable stuff, you want to make sure it's insured. You want to get there first to uh, make sure that somebody doesn't walk off with something. I mean, I've, I've dealt with cases where, again, one sibling got to the house first, literally cleaned it out and put it in a storage bin, and the other kids show up and it's all gone. The house is empty. And, you know, A, that's wrong, B, that's frustrating, C, it caused this huge fight and nobody speaks to each other again. But, you know, I mean, what's, <laughs> it's just, it's so unnecessary if you have a plan and the plan is well done, then you not can't necessarily eliminate trouble. I think you would say that. But, but we you can, can minimize, minimize it, it. We can for minimize sure. it for sure. So um, I maybe have talks too with your kids ahead of time, ahead. Yeah. Um, just just of what to expect. <clears throat> um, and then I know, like my mom, I lost my father um, almost a year ago, and um, that got her thinking. And my parents were Depression era right. kids, and so there's a lot of stuff to go well, through at their house for sure. And so every time <clears throat> I go visit my mom, she's making us take something home. She has um, <laughs> a piece of china for one of the girls or you know like something right. of my dad's to give to my son. So um, she's kind of getting rid of some stuff ahead of time, which is one way to um, minimize it. But the other thing is to, to let them know perhaps um, what not the details of their plan. I know that we're good about um, having family meetings sometimes mm -hmm. um, with some of our clients so that the, that the kids understand the basics of how the plan works without knowing the details of the right. assets. But knowing, okay, we've named this person and they're going to be the one to kind of secure everything. Mm -hmm. And then you'll work together to, to, to get people who, how, you know, who wants what and, and work it out. Right. But let them know that someone is going to be organizing that. And it's not just... Um, a free-for-all because 
oral wills, you know, um, are not recognized in Texas. And so let's go into that, all right, because you brought that up before we went on camera about uh, mom said I could have this. That's what I see the most. Well, mom said I could have this. Dad said I could have this. Well, who knows if mom said that or right. not, and she might have said that to each kid. Who knows? And it's just right. not really the way it goes. Um, their personal property is governed by your will. Um, mm -hmm. When we have a trust, we assign that personal property into the trust, so it should be managed by either the executor of the will or the trustee of the trust. If you don't have either um, and you end up having a probate estate, it's going to pass by intestacy law, but you normally have someone administering that state as well, and that person um, would be the one to take control of the assets, secure them, um, maybe catalog them, you know, see, mm -hmm. the, see the condition that they're in. Um, another important thing is, we kind of talked about it too, that brought it up in my, in my mind, is um, like the house. You need to make sure that the, the, the person in charge contacts the insurance company <coughs> and lets them know that, that perhaps the house is unoccupied at this time right. and get the estate on the, um, on the policy so that if something happens, um, I read a case where someone had passed away and after the person passed away, the house caught on fire and the insurance company denied the claim mm -hmm. because the insured was no longer living. And so um, you wanna make sure to get those sort of things in order. And too. maybe insure the personal property. Again, uh, maybe there's some valuable jewelry. Um, you can insure jewelry. Uh, you can list it on a policy. And back to Ann's point on an unoccupied home. Most insurance policies have a set number of days where they'll cover an unoccupied property with the regular insurance. But after that period of time, it could be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, <clears throat> they don't want to cover it and they won't cover it under the policy the family may have purchased before the death because it's an unoccupied property and they're worried about somebody setting up a meth lab there, squatters, homeless people, whatever. So great point, great point. Get that property insured if it's unoccupied get the personal property insured so somebody doesn't lose this valuable thing that mom said I could have, but really maybe mom in another place in writing gave it to somebody else. This is true. And sometimes, we've been talking more about just the normal stuff that you find around your house, mm -hmm. but sometimes there are things like art collections. Um, and the jewelry can be valuable too, sure. but sometimes or there's been baseball card collections. We, oh, yeah. we, I had a, an incident actually with a baseball card collection that went missing and we had to try and locate because somebody had gotten a hold of the baseball mm -hmm. card collection and they said, well, I gave that as a gift so I get that back. Right. That could be a potential way to agree upon um, divvying up property. Right. Sometimes you can say, whatever you gave me goes back to you. But it's not automatic and that's just not the right. way you that gotta it works. you got to have it in writing too. You want to just, again, one of the things we do here uh, just to let you all know is when our clients sign their estate plan, they get everything in a big three-ring tab binder. They also get a flash drive with all the um, documents on it. But we also give our clients this personal effects section where you can list where you want things to go. You can list what the item is, who gets it, and this on column is an interesting column. This goes on my death, if it's an M in the on column. This goes on my spouse's death, if it's an S in the on column. So that if there's something I want to make sure goes to this person at my death, I put an M and they get it then. Um, if it was my wife Cindy, she might put M behind some of her jewelry to make sure it goes to the right person. So if she passes first and I survive her, I'm not draping that jewelry over my new wife's neck. Okay, that's an M. On the other hand, the dining room furniture, um, if she dies first or I die first, we may put an S there because I may be having dinner on the dining room table and the kids come that, in to yeah. haul it off. You know, wait, right. slow down. So we have that too, but my favorite part of this, and it gets back to Ann, uh, what you just said about writing things down, the significance of it, is we give our clients something we call the significance page. Ta-da. And the significance page is where you can tell the story of the item. I like that. I do too. I love that. And it's, it's not the ring. It's not the rifle. It's where to it come from. What's the history? We're trying to prevent the first stop from the funeral home being the pawn shop. 
that make sense? It does. And so we also give you this too. Now, in we want to be, uh, of course, uh, straightforward with all this. Do many people fill out those lists? Now, I like those lists. I love those lists. Because um, you, don't, you can mark up those lists, and it doesn't mark up your actual legal document. Mm -hmm. And so, and you can leave the, the bulk of your property to your kids in equal shares in your document, but you can go back. Maybe you have a cousin or a friend that you want to give a certain item to, sure. and you can leave it differently in those lists. But to answer your question, I think in 12 years of administering estates, maybe three people have actually filled out the personal property memo. Um, it depends on your personality, but um, right. but it's it's not very often used. But it is a very good tool if you understand how to use the tool and if you want to minimize risks. So uh, it's there, and somewhere again, if we can get you to write down to commit where it goes, it's in writing. Mom told me I got it. Well, maybe mom didn't. I mean, again, uh, Anne's point earlier. A lot of this goes back to what you said to me when I was in the fifth grade. Right. And I remember what you said to me when I, I was in the fifth grade, and I've always hated you for that. Well, this is a great place. This is where the stuff comes out, the knives come out. And we've heard of stories of, again, particularly in-laws getting involved, and they, they mess things up. In fact, in our plans, uh, we now have language that we tell the kids, please don't get your spouses involved because it's just going to make it harder. We can't prohibit it, but we can discourage it. And things, again, to keep the family together, to minimize risks of fractures, lifetime forever fractures, we try. Uh, it's it's in an artful art. Uh, we can't always hit the nail on the head, but we sure do try. Um, and let's talk about, uh, again, um, the best way to make sure that um, risk is minimized. To use your list and to communicate. Communication um, okay. with your family, I think, is the best way. And a written communication would be um, optimal. Um, optimal, good word. Optimal. But, uh, yeah, and to have a plan um, what happens when they don't agree? Because most of our, our, our language says, you know, I leave it to my kids in equal shares mm -hmm. um, as they agree. If they don't agree, um, our trustee or our executor can use different tools, maybe flip a coin, mm -hmm. do an auction. Um, I, that was something in an article that you'd shared mm -hmm. um, that I found interesting is they basically held an auction between the beneficiaries. And so if you really wanted it, you bid on it. Mm -hmm. And that whatever you bid on was the portion that came out of your, your share. share. So right. if you wanted, if you really wanted it, you could outbid your siblings. Um, it seemed pretty fair to me. Um, Where things come down, I think, and we talked about this uh, right before um, our program here, is there's some items that can't be divided. It is the, to a certain extent, the crown jewel uh, of the estate. And I had a case many years ago well, this sweet widow had three children, and she had a ceramic bean pot, okay? And bean pot, she cooked beans on Sunday, put in the oven to simmer or cook while she went to church. She came back, family dinner, Christmas, excuse me, Sunday dinner. Everything came out of the bean pot. What a wonderful thing, and she knew that if she gave it to one of the kids, the others would be resentful. She didn't know what to do, and I told her to break the pot. Just break the pot, because whatever the sentimental value of that pot is, isn't worth destroying your family over. Right. You know, and there's a whole website, at least there used to be, that the University of Minnesota put together called Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate. It was a whole website just to illustrate the seriousness and the complexity of this. There's probably nothing more complex we deal with here than personal property and heirs, siblings, uh, whatever, trying to figure this thing out. It's, again, I just used the term uh, inartful, okay? It's hard, and we don't have a magic wand, but by doing a few things using lists, okay, writing things down, talking to your loved ones, um, 
telling them that you don't want them to fight over stuff. Uh, using a significance page, do you give them the story of the item? Um, we've got something in our house that Cindy's grandparents got from the people who used to own the bar that they used to live over in a little town in Illinois. Bar, great grandma and grandpa's apartment, and they got something from the bar that's still valuable to them and it's still in the family. Real cool. Tell the stories. Tell the story of the shotgun. Tell the story of the rifle. Um, we have to be careful. Let's go to firearms for a quick end. Um, about distributing firearms to people who may be ineligible to own firearms. That's the main concern, okay. or if it's a certain type of firearm that needs to be registered. Mm -hmm. So um, it's the ATF that governs, you know, registration of Alcohol, firearms. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, right. And so um, for most normal firearms, you don't have a, a registration necessarily for them. Right. And so the big deal there is if you are leaving it to your son that might be a felon and not able to own a firearm, mm -hmm. that would mm -hmm. be an, an issue. So as an executor or a trustee, you want to make sure you're not distributing as someone that's not supposed to be receiving right. them. And then there's certain firearms that have a different um, class to them that do need to be registered and mm -hmm. you need to make sure that those get registered properly. Those are class three firearms and they tend to be automatic weapons or suppressors, silencers, sawed off shotguns, things like that. They do have to be registered. They need to be in a gun trust. Uh, we put language in our plans now that if the deceased said, I want this automatic weapon, the suppressor, to go to this person. If the person is ineligible to get it, then the trustee can't give it to them. Otherwise, if the trustee gives it to them or the executor gives it to them, the trustee or executor commits a felony, their own felony, for giving it to an unlicensed person or a person not eligible to own it. So we put that language in there just because. Um, and it doesn't happen often, but there are plenty of people running out there that should not, cannot legally own it, and uh, we don't want to have somebody inadvertently commit a felony. And they're pretty serious about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, firearms are a special uh, category of things that we want to be especially careful with. Okay. Well, I think we've done a good job uh, going through this topic. It's, again, uh, a pleasure to have you here, Anne. Thank and you, you have a great team, and we take great care of people who've lost loved ones. Again, that's the rubber meets the road of this whole thing. If we can help you, if we can help anybody you know with a probate, a trust administration, maybe somebody died without any planning at all, we can help with that too. Uh, Compromise consultation, um, we're, we're here to help any way we can. We have a great team and we're sensitive and we're smart. So thank you very much for watching and we'll see you the next time we have another edition of the Estate of the Union.